Well, it is good to see everybody. It really is. I got to tell you, every week we say the same thing. We welcome our campuses, whether you're hanging out in Kenosha or Racine, you're watching us online. Man, we have so many people now engaging online. More people engage with us online than our in-person services. But don't leave me hanging. I don't want you out of here. But uh, we just want you to know we love you and we thank you for taking the time to join us. So here's the deal. We're in week two of a teaching series that we're simply calling All Day, Every Day. And if you have an Apple Watch, you recognize these rings, you recognize these half circles, and they turn into full circles because it is a health app on the watch. And this series is all about our health, all right? More specifically, this series is about our emotional health. And the big idea that we're going to reference week after week after week is this, that it's impossible to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. It's impossible to be spiritually mature if our life is going to be driven by instant gratification. It's impossible to be spiritually mature if we go through life and we're inconsiderate and insensitive to others. Or if we throw tantrums every time we don't get our way. Or if when we experience stress, it's like our entire life falls apart. It's impossible to be spiritually mature when we make quick judgment calls on other people or when we have a difficult time relating to or caring about the pain of others. And so just because someone loves Jesus, just because they're really good and disciplined at praying, just because they love to sing in times of musical worship, just because they uh, show up to in-person services or engage with us online or listen to our podcast, right? Just because someone talks a lot about the Lord does not mean that they are spiritually mature. It is impossible to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. And so this teaching series is all about emotionally healthy spirituality. And if you're in one of our groups and you're part of the discussions that are centered around this particular series, I realize that this is one of the most challenging season, uh, seasons to be in a group because we're talking about things we don't normally talk about. At its very core, emotionally healthy spirituality is our ability to be self-aware and love well as we follow Jesus. That's the goal, that we get to a point where we're self-aware and we love well as we follow Jesus. Now, in June of 1994, there was a tragedy that unfolded in San Antonio. There was a 13-year-old kid by the name of Nicholas Barclay who was playing basketball with his buddies, and he never ended up, uh, he never went home. And there were searches, there were investigations done, nothing came up, nobody could find Nicholas Barclay. Well, three years later, uh, authorities received a random call from a shelter in Spain that said, hey, Nicholas is living at the shelter. And apparently what had happened is he had escaped from a sex ring operation, but he was still alive. And so his sister flew from America to Spain, confirmed that it was him, and eventually uh, brought him back to Texas. And, and everybody, as you can imagine, Nicholas' family, they're thrilled. They're thrilled to have him back. Uh, he's living at home. He was there for almost six months. And then a suspicious private investigator discovered that it actually wasn't Nicholas. It was a con artist by the name of Frederick Bourdine. And the family couldn't believe it. Even though Frederick had a French accent and his eyes and his hair uh, were a different color than Nicholas, they genuinely believed that it was their son. And so a reporter says to Frederick, how did you pull it off? And his answer was like somewhere Deep inside of people, they try to convince themselves of certain things. And he says, I'm convinced that that is exactly what happened in this situation. And his explanation actually makes sense, right? Because all of us have had imposters that made their way into our lives. Imposters are the stories and the worldviews and the philosophies and the thoughts and opinions that have made their way into our lives and have shaped us without us realizing the impact that they're having without us understanding that some of those worldviews and some of those beliefs and some of those thoughts and opinions are completely rooted in lies or in half-truths. And what happens is when those imposters stick around long enough, we just become accustomed to it. And so Nicholas Barclay's family, he's, they're, they're there six months just thinking, hey, this is a little odd. We're trying to get used to what it's like living with our son again, not realizing that, hey, this actually isn't their son. 
And so as followers of Jesus, it is absolutely critical that you and I take the time to go through the very difficult work of identifying who our true self is and then trying to separate who our true self is from our false self. The Apostle Paul writes about this to his first century readers living in Ephesus. He says, since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. He says, instead, let the spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes, put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Paul says, as followers of Jesus, you need to figure out who you are and who you are not. You need to discover how God has shaped you. That is not easy. And it's the reason that most people go to their graves without really knowing who they are. When we look at our personality, when we look at our temperament, when we look at the things we like or dislike, when we take time to evaluate our thoughts and our feelings, without realizing it, often as we reflect on our values or our beliefs or some of the things that, you know, that we would say, this is who I am, often without realizing it is we've just been shaped by other people. We've been shaped by the values and beliefs and expectation of others. And I suppose it's true for all of us to, to an extent, right? And so what we have to do is try to figure out, hey, who am I really? What is my true identity? And that is not easy to do because we are constantly being tempted to become somebody that's not our true self. Now, there is a really bizarre story about Jesus that takes place at the start of his public ministry. So at the time, Jesus is roughly 30 years old, and nobody really knows him. I mean, he's got friends, he's got family, but nobody understands that, hey, this is God. There's something very special about him because he hasn't done anything miraculous. He doesn't uh, have crowds of people follow him. He hasn't healed anybody. He hasn't done, you know, taught anything revolutionary. But all of that is about to change. And so Jesus is at this point, he's ready to launch his public ministry and he prepares himself with 40 days of prayer and fasting. Goes away into the wilderness. Where he goes, the exact location is unknown. Most experts think it was just right outside of Jericho. Uh, so there is a mountain there right now that's called the Mountain of Temptation. And this is where Jesus goes and he prays and he eats nothing for 40 days. That is a long time, right? For some of us, a 40-minute fast would be a stretch, you know? Most of us certainly couldn't go 40 hours without eating. But Jesus fasts for 40 days. And at the end of the fast, as you can imagine, he's alone, he's isolated, he's hungry, he's tired. And it's at this point in the story that Jesus has a very odd encounter with the devil. Now, if you've been around Great Lakes Church for a while, you know I feel uncomfortable with the term devil. All right, I say this every time. I feel uncomfortable with the word Satan. I just get a little anxious because uh, to me, Satan just feels like this made up entity, right? Every picture you have of him, this is Satan, right? He's got the red suit. He's got, you know, horns on his head, holding a pitchfork. Sometimes he has a, you know, name tag that says Lucifer or Tom Brady. But at any point, that's, that's the idea I get for, for Satan. But yet when Jesus talks about Satan, and when Jesus references the devil, he, he's talking about someone who's real. He's talking about this entity, this, this person who schemes and uh, plans and strategizes on how to destroy lives. So the, the devil is the personification of evil and the originator of all that is false. Here's how Jesus himself describes the devil. He says, he has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. I don't know if you've ever realized this, but Satan lies to you and Satan lies to me. And Satan wants us to believe things about ourselves that is not true, and he wants us to believe things about others that is not true, and he wants to draw us away from who we really are on the inside and how God has made us. And so here Jesus is, he's nearing the end of his fast. He's alone, he's isolated, he's hungry, he's tired, and he is confronted with temptation. Here's what we read. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, if you are really from God, if you are God in the flesh, then tell this stone to become a loaf of bread. In other words, Jesus, if there is something special about you, if you are really from God, 
then prove it by doing something miraculous. I mean, you're obviously hungry. So what I want you to do is turn this stone into bread. And if you do, I promise, man, your fame will go every. People are going to hear about you instantly. They're going to be impressed. And Jesus says to Satan, he says, I'm gluten-free. I don't eat bread. That's what, you know, he didn't say. No, he just, he resisted this temptation. But the temptation that he's confronted with is the very temptation that we're all confronted with on a regular basis. And that is this, that I am what I do. This is what Satan is ultimately tempting Jesus with. That your performance is what matters. Every day our culture is asking questions like, what have you achieved and what have you accomplished? And have you demonstrated your value and have you proven yourself? Well, Jesus knows who he is. He doesn't feel this need to prove that he's God in the flesh. And so again, he resists temptation. Here's what happens next. Then the devil took him up and revealed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. I will give you the glory of these kingdoms and authority over them, the devil said, because they are mine to give to anyone that I please. I will give it all to you if you will worship me. Again, odd encounter going on here. Jesus is in the wilderness. He's basically looking out at all these things that the world has to offer, sex and fame and money and power. And Satan is trying to tempt him with the very things that he tries to tempt you and I with. It's the temptation to believe that I am what I have. That possessions, that what I possess, the education, the talents, the personality, the resources that I possess, that that is what ultimately matters. And I think in some of our weakest moments, we all have to fight that struggle to remind ourselves that our worth and our value are not directly to con- connected to what we've achieved, accomplished, or accumulated. Because it's so easy to go down that route in our mind, and it's the temptation to focus on the kingdom of this world. But again, here's the key. Jesus knew who he was. Jesus looked at what he did not have, and he was not uncomfortable with it. He didn't feel like he was lacking. He didn't feel like this is what's going to make me a complete person and a whole person, and this is what's going to make me feel successful. He understood that it was a mirage. And so he resists temptation. And then the story continues. The devil took him to Jerusalem to the highest point of the temple and said, if you are the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say, he will order his angels to protect and guard you. And they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt hurt your foot on a stone. Right now, to give you an idea of the the temptation Jesus is being confronted with here, uh, he's now obviously left the wilderness, right? And he's in Jerusalem. And here's a model of the temple at Jerusalem. And so it's, you know, kind of try to build the scale. If you got a little house here, what, what not? So Jesus is at, on the temple mount, right? You got these huge walls and um, it's obviously a lot bigger than this, but he, he's being tempted to say, hey, throw yourself over. Let the angels catch you. Now, remember at this point, Jesus doesn't have a following. People don't know that he's God in the flesh. And so if Jesus jumps off these, these temple, you know, walls, and he does not die, he is going to have an instant following. Success is going to come like that. He'll be famous. TikTok videos of him being shared with everyone. Everybody's going to know you're divine. There's something special about you. And so the temptation that Jesus is being confronted with is a temptation to believe that I am what others think. It's all about popularity. Now, for many of us, my guess is this is probably our greatest temptation. And it may not necessarily fall into the word popularity and fame, but it's a temptation to care about what others think. It's the reason that we stress over what to say or not say in conversations because we care about how we're being perceived, right? It's the reason that we're not always transparent because I don't want them to know this about me. It's the reason that we have such a difficult time having tough conversations with people. Let's be honest. I mean, if you're an employer, or you're a manager, or you're a boss of some sort, and you're supposed to have a tough conversation with someone, the temptation is to avoid that tough conversation, and you justify it, and I justify it by saying things like, well, I don't want to have the tough conversation because I don't want to make them feel bad. I don't want to make them feel like a loser. I don't want to make them feel like they're not measuring up, when in reality, the reason we don't want to have the tough conversation is because we don't want to feel bad. 
We don't want to have the emotional discomfort. We don't want to feel that, that awkwardness inside of us. We want to be perceived a certain way. And I know there are people who, uh, they, you know, they're tough and they're gruff, and they say, yeah, that may be most people. That ain't me. I couldn't care less what people think about me. And you get around this person, the people who know him say, yeah, he, he couldn't care less what people think. He's saying that he couldn't care less. Oh, sure he does. That person who says they couldn't care less what other people think, they want you to think that they're so secure and so tough and so confident who they are that they're the person who couldn't care less what other people think. All right, this is, this is how people are. We, we all care to some extent. And the truth is most of us care very deeply about what others think, and it's the reason why our self-image is going to soar when someone compliments us and we're devastated when someone criticizes us. And so Jesus is tempted with fame and he's tempted with popularity. But once again, he resists because he knew who he was. True freedom comes when we are confident and secure in who we are. Well, after Jesus leaves the wilderness, he starts going from town to town and he's speaking in the different synagogues and eventually he gets to his hometown, which is Nazareth. And he goes into the synagogue and when he walks into the synagogue, here's what happens. The scroll of Isaiah the prophet was handed to him. So there's this attendant there. They see Jesus. He's already started to have this reputation for him. I mean, we're talking days, weeks away from, you know, his 40 days of prayer and fasting. And so this attendant hands him a scroll and he unrolls it and found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. Jesus reads these words from Isaiah, hands the scroll back to the attendant. He looks around at the people in the temple, and he says, hey, these words written by Isaiah hundreds of years ago, just so you know, they've been fulfilled today in your presence because I'm the person Isaiah was writing about. The words Isaiah writes are a reference to my mission. Jesus knew who he was. He understood his purpose. He knew his value and he knew his worth. Don't miss this. Whenever we go through the deep work of figuring out who we are and separating our false self, who everybody else wants us to be, and our true self, who God has designed us to be, we will become more confident in who we are. It'll be easier for us to resist temptation because that's not who I am. That's not my life. I'm not pursuing that. I already know who I am. We become more focused. We know the path that we're on and where it's leading us. But, and don't miss this, at the same time, we end up disappointing a lot of people. This past week, I officiated a wedding for uh, a guy who's been in our church many, many years. The Blankenship family has been here for, you know, 12 plus years. And Mark was under the impression that he was going to see his bride for the first time. But instead, his dad puts on a dress and comes up behind him to tap him on the shoulder. And uh, Mark's thinking, man, this is my girl, Ashley, that I've been dating for a while, right? He's super, super excited. We had to slow it down because the video just moves so quickly otherwise. But here he is. He's just going to tap him on the shoulder. Oh, come on, Mark. Unfortunately, when he does turn around, it happens so quickly that you can't hardly even see his reaction. But there he is. He turns around and, uh, oh, got dad, got dad. And it's just unbelievable, right? Total day of disappointment, total moment of disappointment, right, for, for him. And of course, they laughed and whatnot. But life is filled with disappointment, specifically when we become more confident in who we are. So Jesus reads from the scroll of Isaiah. He says, hey, this is talking about me. And people become so upset with him that they try to kill him. When we discover our, our true selves, the people who have expectations of us will inevitably become angry and disappointed if it doesn't fit their mold. Jesus disappointed religious leaders because he didn't always follow their traditions, keep their rules, or answer all their questions. He disappointed many of the Jews because they wanted him to be an earthly Messiah who would feed them and fix their problems and, and, and overthrow the Roman oppressors. But Jesus knew that's not what he was there to do. He disappointed the crowds because often in his teachings, he would say things that confronted their long-held beliefs. And so there'd be controversy and arguments. In fact, on one occasion, there are 
just a crowd of people around Jesus, and he's teaching. And they become so disillusioned by what he taught that we read this. At this point, many of his disciples, that's not a reference to the 12 disciples, it's just a reference to his followers. At this point, many of his followers turned away and deserted him. People who had been following him, some for months, some for maybe a year or longer. They heard him say something that they didn't like and they turned around. Jesus disappointed lots of people. And the fact is, emotionally healthy people aren't controlled by the approval or disapproval of others. Emotionally healthy individuals are people who know their beliefs and their values and their goals, and they aren't constantly being influenced by what everyone thinks about them. So they walk into one setting and they're this way. They walk into another setting and they're another way. Now, I do think I need to say this just to be super clear. I know a lot of people who are very confident in their beliefs and their values. And when you talk to them, man, they are straightforward. They are immovable in what they believe. And they're still emotionally unhealthy and immature. So it's possible to be confident and still emotionally immature because emotionally healthy people are people who have this non-anxious presence about them. So when people are emotionally healthy, yes, they know who they are, and yes, they know what they believe, and yes, they know what they value. But when they're interacting with people who maybe disagree with them, who see the world different, they don't get defensive. And they don't reject the person, and they don't avoid them, and they don't criticize them, uh, in order to maybe validate themselves or elevate themselves above that person. They're just this non-anxious presence. And they don't feel the need to get sucked into every argument. And they don't feel the need to express every one of their feelings. Anytime someone gets super defensive because someone disagrees with them, quite honestly, it's a sign that they are emotionally immature. And the goal is emotional health. More specifically, emotionally healthy spirituality. And so let me just close by asking the question, how do we get there? How do we get there? Well, emotionally healthy spirituality begins with a commitment to allow ourselves to feel and to experience and to express emotions. Now, we, we, we don't do talks like this at Great Lakes Church very often, right? Uh, I, me, me personally, I say I'm not a a uh, very emotional person, but I suppose that that would be a lie. I'm highly emotional, right? But like crying, right? I don't get real sensitive on, on different things. It's hard for me to be sensitive, right? That'd be an emotional area probably to work on. The uh, last time I cried was when my uh, brother Rick was killed. So that was 20, 2008. Prior to that, I don't remember the last time I cried. Prior to like, I was 12 years old, you know? And, and, and so uh, emotionally healthy spirituality begins with this commitment that we're gonna allow ourselves to feel emotions. And, and I know it's an uncomfortable question. It just feels so odd that we're talking about it. But man, when's the last time you really truly allowed yourself to feel and experience and express emotions? Because emotions are an essential part of being human. We were made in the image of God. And when we read the different manuscripts that make up our Bible, it's just obvious that God had emotions. There's so many different attributes attributed to God, right? Love and joy and compassion. At times, anger and jealousy and grief. And it, it almost feels disrespectful. Well, I mean, how, how could God be angry or jealous? It's because we have this one-track mind that if it's going to be anger, it's going to be unhealthy. If it's a jealousy, it's going to be an unhealthy type of jealousy. But God created human beings to feel a wide range of emotion. And, and when you look at the different emotions, there's you know, hundreds of different variations and blends and nuances to those emotions. But emotions are a gift from God. And admittedly, the way that we express them sometimes is not healthy and not good. And so as followers of Jesus, we really have to go through the difficult work of learning how to experience emotions, understand them, and then express them appropriately. For a lot of us, again, I'm putting myself in that category. It's just not something that's, natural, easy to do, that I think about very often. You know, about 30 years ago, Reba McIntyre wrote a song called The Greatest Man I Never Knew. And it's a song about a grown child narrating her life story and 
throughout these songs, she keeps talking about her dad, who she saw every single day. They lived in the same house. But she says, I never really knew him because of how busy he was. He was always working. and He didn't know how to interact with me. And so she calls the song, The Greatest Man That I Never Knew. And the song has become a classic because it's a song that guys in every single generation uh, can relate to, right? Most dads want to connect with their kids, but it's just hard to. It's just, I don't know how to express. I don't know how to you know, talk about what I'm feeling. If we want to become emotionally healthy, then we need to learn how to experience and express and feel. And the way that, you know, the first step to kind of moving in that direction is just making it a rhythm in our life and a practice in our life to find time for silence in solitude so we can think and reflect. Many of us learned from a young age that we needed to hide what we are feeling from other people. And so we got the, emo- you know, the, the message that somehow showing emotions make us look weak. And, and so over time, we become very skilled at hiding what we feel, not just from other people, but even from ourselves. Almost to the point, like, I don't really truly know how I feel. But hiding emotions is not a sign of courage or strength. And if we want to grow, we have to get to that point where we're just honest with ourselves. And we're aware of what's happening on the inside. Because there are things happening on the inside. I I listened to a podcast this past week, and I uh, heard the story of Oliver Oliver Sippel. uh, First time I ever heard it. And the story... Uh, Pretty straightforward. It was the morning of September 22nd, 1975. Oliver Sippel went out for a walk. A couple hours later, to his own surprise, he ended up saving the life of President Gerald Ford from this deranged female assassin who had a gun. All right, so you see him on the corner and he's jumping when he sees this gun coming out and uh, apparently a shot went out and just missed him. and, And he became a national hero overnight. Marine, right, well respected guy. People were talking about it. Individuals were buying his dad drinks at work and his brother's ram, and this guy was a celebrity, big, big deal. But then it was discovered that he was gay. And within the same week that he was a hero, he was rejected by his parents. They said they didn't want to see him again. His siblings rejected him. It leaked out in the newspapers. He ended up having to sue seven different newspapers for releasing personal information about him without his consent. consent. And it's not going to surprise you that in the years that followed, he became an alcoholic and was treated for schizophrenia. 1989, he's found dead inside of his apartment where he lived alone, half-gallon bottle of bourbon at a side. The coroner estimated he'd been there two weeks before he was discovered, 47 years old. And I heard that story, and based on the series that we're in, it just hit me. I was like, it's just so obvious that the second half of his life dramatically impacted by words that were spoken to him, by shame that he felt, by experiences he went through. And yet, if we were one-on-one inside a therapist's office and you said, because you're the therapist, you say, hey, Dave, what's kind of shaped your life? What are some of the big moments in your life? I got to be honest with you. I was thinking about this. I just don't know. I mean, I could tell you a couple key events. I just have never really thought about the very things that make me me. I can probably figure out what's made you, you, right? I look at the person you're married to, right? I look at your kid. I'm like, dear God, that was my kid. I'd be crazy too, right? But man, it's so hard for me to identify this for myself. So when's the last time you reflected? When's the last time you looked at your life, your relationships, your finances, your work, your health, right? Your your life collectively, whether, you know, the past or present, maybe the future, and and just reflected, contemplated, considered what is it that makes me most happy? What is it that just fires me up in a horrible way and just gets me angry? What is it that causes me to be sad? What is it that gets me anxious? As ridiculous as it sounds, and it just almost feels like, "Eh, come on, Dave, is really this an issue that we should be talking about now? I mean, it just feels like some psychological thing. Come on, Jesus withdrew from the crowds of people on a regular basis, and he went to the wilderness and to connect with his heavenly father, to take time to reflect and evaluate. If you find yourself critical of other people, have you ever just stopped and said, why am I so critical? If you find yourself impatient on a regular basis, what's driving me to be so impatient? If you find it difficult to admit flaws and failures to other people, have you ever just thought, hey, why is it that I'm so uncomfortable doing that? If you're always offended by something, so easily offended, or you you get really defensive when people criticize you, have you just thought, why do I care so much? 
If you struggle living according to your values and unlike Jesus, you find yourself always giving into the same temptations over and over and over. Have you just stepped back and say, why is that? Because being curious about what's going on in the inside of us is an essential part to becoming emotionally healthy. What questions are you asking yourself to help you better understand the process of feeling? During our relationship series, I always bring out what we call the wheel of emotions. And I bring this out because I say, and I know it's difficult to see, but um, I say, uh, you know, we have these emotions. and We all know it's like to be angry or fearful or, you know, surprised or happy. But what we don't think about is learning to express it more than I'm just angry right now. I'm pissed off. I'm, you know, I feel let down. I feel right now just very frustrated or distant. I, I guess I'm just jealous right now. I'm feeling provoked. You can just do a Google search for uh, wheel of emotions and this will pop up, but we have to become better at identifying and learning and expressing emotion. Facing our emotions creates a better, healthier version of ourselves. And the things that stand between you and a better you may absolutely be your feelings. And so my challenge to you is to go through this awkward, weird, difficult process of regularly building a rhythm into our life, in your life, right, of getting away and reflecting and identifying some of the things that have shaped us into who we are. And as you identify imposters and you're like, man, I've adopted this worldview and I've adopted this belief system, but man, the more I get to who I am, this isn't me, getting rid of those imposters and trying to find the truest version of ourselves. And the reason we're doing an eight-week series on this is it doesn't happen overnight. And every week, I just want to peel back a little bit of the layer. So this week, last week, the, the layer was just praying a simple prayer, and we're going to end with it again t- this evening or, uh, you know, today. But um, the, 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 uh, the second kind of version is just learning to identify and understand and experience and feel our various emotions. So we end with the prayer that King David prayed 3,000 years ago. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Heavenly Father, help us as we pause and reflect. Maybe just take time to find some peace of mind. Help us to be able to identify the various things in our life that have shaped us and molded us into who we are. And as we learn to feel different emotions, I pray help us to learn to express them in healthy ways so that we can become healthier versions of ourselves. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.